Ambassador Karstens, thank you so much for joining us. Very glad to be here with you, uh, Rosemary. Thank you. As we've been talking about, uh, we're at the one-year mark now uh, since Evan Gerskovich was arrested in Russia on Thursday when the Kremlin was asked about talks of a possible exchange. The Kremlin spokesperson said silence was needed uh, and that public remarks were not helpful. What, what do you make of those comments? How would you, if you could, publicly describe the state of negotiations? Well, this might be the one time that I'll agree with the Russians. I think uh, uh, we don't really progress too much when we start negotiating in public. Uh, sometimes it's good to have those discussions uh, and have them kept private and secret. Um, what I can say, and you probably have heard this before, is that uh, the United States has had a channel with the Russians that we've used for the last uh, few years, actually. Uh, that channel has been successful in bringing back Trevor Reed from Russia, mm -hmm. Brittany Griner. And it's the same channel that we've used to continue discussions on bringing back Paul Whelan and now Evan Gershkovich. It is or was there, we, we had heard reports after the death of Alexei Navalny that there, there was a prisoner swap, a deal that had been agreed to. It, was that accurate? Was that report accurate? Well, what I can tell you is, that, and it's kind of what Jake Sullivan said in uh, the National Security Advisor uh, uh, this past Sunday, uh, he said that the Russians never raised Navalny as name in discussions. But I think what I can tell you is that, uh, again, it doesn't do us any good to really get into the details. Uh, maybe I would say that if, it, if I felt it would further my ability to bring back Paul Whelan and Evan Gershkovich, yeah. uh, I would absolutely be talking about it in public. But I think the Russians actually had it right where uh, getting into the details or in a way fact-checking every uh, uh, story that might yeah. come forward uh, might prove actually detrimental to bringing the guys home. Fair enough, and, and I certainly don't want to put um, anyone's life in, or, or freedom in jeopardy. Uh, but a few days ago, as you know, that the court in Moscow did extend the pretrial detention for another three months. Was that surprising to you, or does that signal anything to you? You know, we don't know. I mean, I've been doing this job for about four years, and a lot of it's uh, involved Russia. It's, it's hard to get into uh, the other side's, uh, I guess, headspace and timing sure. to figure out what they're doing uh, most of the time. Uh, in a way, I'm hopeful that we can get something done before Evan actually starts a trial. So the fact that his uh, pretrial detention was extended by 90 days, mm. I'm, I'm just going to have to look at that as a positive uh, factor. And maybe the Russians are signaling that they want to knock out a deal in the next 90 days. Maybe they're not. Mm. But that gives us, I think, some more time and space to try to figure out a way to come, come to a deal that the Russians will take and that the United States can bring to bear. The, the fact that Vladimir Putin has mentioned uh, Evan a couple of times, both in a speech and in that interview he did with Tucker Carlson, um, what, what does that tell you about um, how he's using Evan or, or wh wh why Evan is detained? Like, does it tell you anything about motivation, I guess? Again, it's hard to put words into uh, any president's mouth, let alone sure. President Putin. Um, I would like to take that as a signal that um, he's you know, absolutely willing to bargain and make a deal with us. Uh, sadly, that's how we have to go about this. I mean, at the end of the day, and it, uh, what I'm about to say will not surprise you, and that it's that Evan is not a spy. Uh, he's a journalist. He was uh, essentially doing his job as a journalist. Yeah. And the Russians should just let him go free and clear. And the same yeah. with uh, Paul Whelan. He should be just released. But the very fact that we have to go into a bargaining uh, situation with the Russians, you know, it's in, in one side, it's, uh, it's abhorrent to us. But on, the, but on the other side, it's the only way that we're going to get these citizens back. And so maybe by President Putin uh, making those statements, he's he's offering uh, that that he is also shared that we need to knock out a deal and bring people home mm -hmm. as well. But again, it's hard to put uh, it's sure. hard to really get into the mindset of the other side at times. For sure. Uh, speaking of Paul Whelan, he called uh, my colleague here at CBC, Briar Stewart, who's the Russia correspondent mm -hmm. for us, not not based in Russia currently. Uh, he called her from prison, and he told her that he believed that Alexei mm -hmm. Navalny's death. Um, made him wonder whether the Kremlin would ever let him free. Uh, and I guess he has real concerns that this is this was not a good sign for him. What would you say uh, uh, about Paul's assessment there? Well, we actually talked to Paul now and then. In fact, the yeah. Secretary of State's talked to Paul three times since last August. And what we always tell him is that, uh, Paul, you know, we're, we're coming to get you. The question is when. We're not going to stop until you're home. And we make sure that uh, we're constantly working on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, a, it's maybe a, a, if I'd tell Paul, it's like uh, we went through these same uh, uh, tough times bringing home 46 Americans under the Biden administration. Yeah. Every, it, not, none of these cases are easy. They're all hard. They're all different. But we work hard. And then suddenly one day someone steps on an aircraft and they come back to the United States of America. And that's what I've always tried to assure Paul when I talk to him. Yeah. Say, Paul, your country isn't, hasn't forgotten you. Uh, stay hard. Stay tough. Stay strong. 
And it's not a question of if you're coming back, it's a question of when, and we're doing everything we can to speed up that clock. Uh, surely, though, that the situation, uh, the, the geopolitical situation, complicates matters. And I want to talk to you about the Middle East in a moment. But the fact that Russia invaded Ukraine and that NATO is working very hard to protect and fund that war, I mean, do, are, do these people then become sort of pawns in a, in a, in a geopolitical game in that case? No, Rosemary, we haven't found that. Uh, two months after uh, Rus Russia uh, uh, launched their full-scale invasion into Ukraine, we were able to talk uh, to the Russians about bringing back Trevor Reed. Mm -hmm. Trevor Reed came back in April yeah. of 2022. Uh, and not too many months after that, Brittany Griner came back. Huh. So what we've found, actually, is that even though countries might have a lot of tension between them, uh, we're still able at times to work through that because for some strange reason, the hostage uh, uh, and or wrongful detention portfolio gets siloed. I, I do want to ask you about the Middle East, because I know you and your deputy have been supporting a multi-agency response when it comes to Israeli hostages in Gaza. You were in Israel in December. Can you, can you give us a sense of what your office is doing to help secure the release of the remaining Israeli-American hostages? Because I believe that's who you're particularly focused on. Well, you know, Rosemary, uh, uh, my deputy Steve Gillen and I have spent time with all the families that uh, have U.S. citizens that have been held in Gaza. Uh, but we've also spent a lot of time with people that uh, did not actually have a U.S. connection or nexus. Hmm. We felt it was important to show support and also to understand what they're going through. So I've probably talked over uh, probably 50 uh, different families, and it's very emotional. You know, you're hearing people that are in pain. They're, they miss their loved ones. Uh, they have a lot of uh, things going through their minds. And we're always mindful that at the end of the day, to an extent, we have two customers. It's the family and also the person being held. Uh, I think in terms of uh, the efforts that my office has offered, um, as you mentioned my deputy. Uh, yeah. Steve went over there and spent 104 days in Israel working with our counterparts uh, on an effort to just build up uh, their capability. Uh, they've actually uh, done a great job, I think, of uh, building up an office that to an extent is my counterpart over there. And we've, we've, as I said, spent time on family engagement. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the negotiation, uh, I think uh, you've seen that the Secretary of State has flown yeah. over there, the President has, and CIA Director Burns. And this is a, an issue that has, has really uh, become front and center uh, with the United States government. So uh, from the highest parts of this government, uh, we're committed to finding a way to resolve this crisis and bring these people home. Okay. Ambassador Karstens, thank you so much for making the time for me again. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you, Rosemary. Take care. Danielle Gershkovich and Paul Beckett, thank you so much for being here, both of you. Thank you. Danielle, I'm going to start with you. It marks one year, incredibly, since your brother Evan was detained in Russia. What can you tell us about how he's doing? What, what have you heard from him? I'm in awe of my brother. He's, uh, he's working very hard to keep his spirits up, um, but... Uh, I saw the recent courtroom footage from the last hearing, and it's incredible to see him smile. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see his spirit is still there, and uh, we write uh, letters to each other weekly, and he's still my little brother teasing me. Um, so it's, it's um, I'm just so amazed by how well he's holding up. Yeah, under incredible conditions. How are you and your parents holding up? Whatever we're going through, Evan is going through something so much harder. So we uh, just have to keep moving forward for him. But seeing him standing so strong, uh, it it helps us keep going. Paul, Evan is obviously the first U.S. journalist to be in prison in Russia since the Cold War ended. What What has the past year been like for you and your colleagues at The Wall Street Journal? Obviously, at first, it was a real body blow to not just to us, but to the cause of press freedom that Evan represents. Uh, I think in the last year, we've uh, run at the story, as journalists do, and tried to do everything we can to be there for Evan, be there for his family, uh, be there for our other foreign correspondents around the world operating okay. in dangerous okay. places, and um, keep as much attention on him as we possibly can so that we can set a landscape that would bring him home when governments get together to negotiate. 
Danielle mentioned uh, the pretrial uh, motion this week. His detention was extended just a few days ago. It was obviously a, a chance to at least see him, uh, which is which brings, I think, some cof comfort. Uh, the U.S. government has classified him as wrongfully detained. What, what can you tell us about the state of his legal case and the support he's getting from, from the newspaper? It's very difficult for us to see what happens next here. We've seen a series of these pretrial detentions, either two or three months, run through the course of the year and now into what will be 15 months by the time the current one expires. But we've had no trial date. We've seen no evidence. The allegations are baseless. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, it, look forward and it's pretty opaque, which is why we are also focused on trying to make sure, do whatever we can to influence the conditions that would lead to a successful negotiation of his release. And that would take place between U.S. government and the Russian government and any other governments that have something to contribute. Danielle, I'm, I, as I mentioned to you before, I'm going to speak with the uh, Special Envoy for Hostage Affairs, Roger Carstens. I've talked to him about your brother and others before. Um, I'm wondering what are the most sort of recent assurances you've got from him or his office about what is being done? to release your brother in some sort of prisoner swap or deal. There had been, of course, those rumors of that uh, around the time of the death of uh, Navalny. What, what are you being told? Um, the White House has uh, said that they are taking this very seriously, and uh, we received a promise from President Biden that he's going to bring Evan home to us. Um, so we're just continuing uh, to just be optimistic. You know, there's a team of experts working around the clock to get Evan home. How, how much pressure are you trying to, is your family trying to apply on, on President Biden or, or Mr. Carstens? Like, obviously, th this will be a political or diplomatic solution. Um, we're being, my family, we're uh, advocates for Evan every day. We also rely so much on the incredible journalist community, uh, mm -hmm. everyone who has been helping in whatever way they can, whether it's reporting about Evan, sharing the hashtag on social media, I stand with Evan. Um, the Wall Street Journal has been an amazing support. Um, but unfortunately, the actual negotiations are a conversation between governments. Mm -hmm. So we just have to, to keep our faith that Evan's going to come back home. Paul, were you surprised uh, after Navalny's death about the reports that there was going to be some sort of a swap and, and Evan's name was, was part of that deal? Well, we've seen uh, since uh, late November, early December, uh, signs that uh, the conversations between the governments are happening. So we saw the State Department say in early December that they had made an offer for Evan that Russia had rejected. Uh, we then saw President Putin talk about Evan twice, once in his annual press conference, and then again at the end of yeah. the interview he did with Tucker Carlson. So yeah. we understand these conversations uh, have been ongoing, and we just look forward to them bearing fruit. As you know, that lots of people had to leave Russia, lots of journalists had to leave Russia as the war in Ukraine uh, got underway, including a, a correspondent here at CBC. Um, obviously, Evan felt it was very important to be there on the ground. Why, why was that so important to him in terms of his work as a journalist? He was our Russia correspondent, and he has been doing excellent work there, so it was natural for him to want to get back to the story and get back to the job. Uh, I do think you've seen in the wake of his uh, detention, uh, a lot of other journalists have left. So it's really an additional benefit for Putin. He gets to, you know, gets a free field for propaganda and fact-based journalism uh, has diminished dramatically in the last year. And that's a serious business. Danielle, obviously, we're talking about your brother as a, as a journalist, uh, and that's what he does. <laughs> but what can you tell us about who he is? He's your younger brother. Um, what what kind of what kind of guy is he? Uh, even though he is my younger brother, he's definitely always had more older sibling energy. He he takes care of the people he loves. He he's always been so encouraging and supportive of me. He also is just the life of the party everywhere he goes. <laughs> he brings people together and he has so many friends uh, all across the world, really. Um, but he's also always been very serious, very driven about the things he's passionate about. 
and he commits 100%. So journalism is his passion. Uh, he, he constantly worked around the clock. Mm. <laughs> um, we would always tell him, you know, take a day off. But he, there was always a story he was chasing. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I hope I get to meet him and talk to him, uh, and I hope that happens soon. Uh, thank you so much for telling us about him, the work he's doing, and, and for reminding us uh, that, that he remains detained. Daniel and Paul, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very thank much, Rosemary. Thank you so much.